All right, so um, last week we were looking at uh, part one of Brother Lewis's material on the Holy Spirit, and it's a two-part treatment of the Holy Spirit that, that he gives. And uh, we basically got through the first point of the first part last week. So, you know, we'll see what we're able to do today. I went ahead and made an outline on the second chapter, and I don't know how much of that we'll get to, uh, but at least you'll have the outline if we don't get to, uh, get to really deal with it much. But in this first chapter, uh, Brother Lewis essentially deals with, uh, I think the language he would prefer are manifestations of the Holy Spirit that Christians have received in this uh, church age or Christian age, whatever you want to term, the period of time from Pentecost until Jesus' second coming. And then in the second chapter, he deals with essentially just miscellaneous thoughts uh, about the Holy Spirit. So um, uh, anyway, last week we talked about that um, you know, in the beginning of the church age, before the New Testament was completed, there was a need for the church to have guidance. And of course, this guidance, miraculous guidance, the revelation of the will of Jesus to the church came primarily through the apostles. And, uh, you know, they were uh, empowered through the baptism in the Holy Spirit uh, to know Jesus' will and to prove that what they were saying really was from Jesus by performing these miracles. But, of course, we know that we began with 12 apostles, and uh, you put that number up to 13 with the addition of Paul, and maybe there's an argument to be made about James, Jesus' half-brother being an apostle because of a passage in Galatians 1, but, but you, you know, you're talking 13 or 14 max apostles, and, you know, you've got the gospel that needs to go into all the world. So the question is, how can churches, without an apostle present, know Jesus' will for them? And so we read in the New Testament about uh, the fact that, that some Christians had these miraculous manifestations of the Spirit like to what you would see an apostle perform. Uh, and for an example of that, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It seems like uh, one of the most blessed churches in this regard in the first century was the church at Corinth. And uh, Paul, for instance, says in 1st, you turn into chapter 12, but I'll, I'll read a passage for you in, in chapter 1. It's 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Paul said, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And, you know, that's not surprising to us because when we read through the book of Acts, we see the church at Corinth established in Acts 18, and you see that the Apostle Paul spent a year and a half with the church at Corinth. So it shouldn't surprise us that they had a lot of miraculous gifts. So here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. And by the way, you know that um, the way that 1 Corinthians is structured, beginning in chapter 7, Paul deals with questions that the Corinthians have asked about certain problems that they have. Uh, they wrote Paul a letter, uh, and, and so Paul addresses these problems. Of course, Paul's in Ephesus when he writes 1 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, let's start in verse 7, and we'll go down through verse 11. Paul says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And by the way, when we look at that in light of uh, what's written in chapter 13, this doesn't appear to be faith that... Uh, is common to all Christians, that's necessary for salvation. This seems to be a special type of faith. It's a miracle-working faith that would enable someone to uh, perform a great feat, probably spoken of in a hyperbolic manner, such as moving a mountain. And, of course, Jesus uses similar language in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, picking up, To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. 
to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. All right, so, um, of course, you see there, if you were to categorize those gifts, even though there are nine miraculous gifts given, those nine miraculous gifts would fall basically into two categories. You have, number one, gifts of knowledge, and number two, you have sign gifts. You know, the knowledge gifts would be gifts like uh, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, the sign gifts would be gifts like healings, miracles, faith, that sort of thing. So one category of gifts are the gifts that, that enable the church to know truth, and the other category of gifts are those gifts that enable them to prove that that truth is not something that is coming from their own head, but something that actually is being revealed to them from above. Now the text says here that uh, the Spirit gives these gifts just as he determines, verse 11. But I think that if we put this together with a passage, especially the passage we read in Acts 8, we'll get a little bit better knowledge. I mean, I think this is an important point, I think, that needs to be made. Um, you know, some people, especially those, well, I won't say that, but some people think that you just need to interpret a passage in light of what that book says. But I think that, that, that we are taught to view the New Testament canonically. In other words, we view it as a harmonious whole. And the New Testament is a closed system. Right? So we shouldn't be bringing in information from outside of the New Testament necessarily to help us understand, especially, I mean, I'm not talking about archaeology and things of that sort, but theologically, it's a closed system. We shouldn't be bringing things in from the outside to help us understand a passage, but passages in the New Testament have a relationship to each other, and we need to appreciate that relationship to each other. And so I think that in Acts 8, we'll see how exactly the Spirit would give these gifts uh, to Christians in the first century. So turn back to Acts 8. Now, you know, the church in Jerusalem scatters in Acts 7... Uh, when Stephen is stoned. And, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. All things work together for good. Uh, the scattering of the Jerusalem church is the means through which the Great Commission is fulfilled. The gospel then goes throughout Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so in Acts 8, we read about it going into Samaria. So in Acts 6, I'll just go ahead and say this. In Acts 6, you know, there's a controversy in the church as to uh, the passing out of a daily dole, especially to the, to the Hellenistic Jewish widows. They've been neglected inadvertently. The apostles, just 12 men, they're covered up, and they've inadvertently uh, overlooked the Hellenistic uh, uh, Jewish widows. And so seven men are chosen in Acts 6 uh, to... Uh, pass out this benevolence to these widows. And uh, two of those seven are uh, Stephen, who's stoned in Acts 7, and then Philip. And, and, I, and I bring us back to this passage because Philip is going to be a major player in Acts chapter 8. Okay, so in Acts 6, let's just go ahead and look at Acts 6. And then I was going to wait to do this, but I think we'll go ahead and do it now. So in Acts 6, there are qualifications given for these, uh, for these men to be chosen. Uh, Stephen and Philip are chosen. And when they're chosen, notice how they're appointed to their work. Acts 6, verse 6. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now that's an important fact. The apostles lay hands on these seven. Now what was the purpose of laying hands on the seven? Well, no doubt... It was a ceremonial function to show that the apostles are, endo are endowing them with the authority to pass out this daily benevolence to the widows. That undoubtedly was a part of it. But I think um, another major part of it is you don't read about anybody but an apostle working a miracle prior to this in the book of Acts. 
But then after this point in the book of Acts, you read about Stephen performing miracles. I mean, the passages that immediately follow this, beginning verse 8. And then in Acts chapter 8, you read about Philip. All right, so let's go to Acts 8. So Acts 8 verse 4, you know, those who were scattered when Stephen uh, was stoned, they went everywhere preaching the word. Verse 5 of Acts 8, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and, note, saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So here's Philip performing miracles of healing, miracles of exorcism, and uh, and the result is is incredible. Verse uh, 12 says, But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 13, Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles which he saw. All right, so, um, important passage. You know, people are converted, people are baptized as they're converted, and uh, Simon, and we skipped over the section with Simon, Simon was a sorcerer prior to his conversion, uh, but he knows that Philip, is doing miracles superior in quality to the miracles that he performed, and so he's following after Philip, just amazed at the miracles that Philip is performing. Now, here's the relevant passage. What happens to those who are baptized by Philip? Verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Now, I think an interesting point here. Uh, and we'll notice this as we study Luke, or as we study Mark. You see it in, in Mark and Luke, uh, especially. Well, actually, especially Luke. But John and his brother James were two of the ones who earlier on the limited commission, as they were going through Samaria and the Samaritans wouldn't receive them, said, "You know, Lord, do you want us to call down he- fire from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did?" But now John's got a little bit better attitude. <laughs> so, so anyway, all right. So so Peter and John. Uh, They go down to Samaria, verse 15. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet, now the NIV says, come on any of them. They simply had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, by the way, when the apostles laid hands on these people, there was some visible way that Simon, or some sort of manifestation that enabled Simon to know that the Spirit had been given with the laying on of the apostles' hands. And if you put this together with other passages, probably it involved speaking in tongues or you know, some other manifestation. But anyway, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So some people read this and they're troubled. Because they say, okay, you've got here these however many people, men and women, in Philippi who are baptized, but the text says in verse uh, Uh, 15 and 16, the apostles came that they might receive the Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they read that and they think, "Uh uh-oh, is there there some contradiction between this and Acts 2? And I would say, no, there is no contradiction. In fact, I would say that Luke, who's writing this, is not saying that they had not received the Spirit at all. In fact, I would say that that Luke's language, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, is intended to cue us into the fact that they've received the common gift of the Holy Spirit that every Christian receives, because that is linked to baptism in the name of Jesus. So turn back and look at Acts 2. Acts 2, verse 
And of course, we'll talk about this point uh, or this manifestation of the Spirit a little bit more in the next point. But here in Acts 2.38, I mean, we're members of the Church of Christ. We can quote this. You know, Peter replied to the question, what do we have to do? By, by saying, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So notice that phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the type of baptism they receive. One in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, to how many who are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit promised? Well, verse 39 is relevant here. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. And, and by the way, that is technical language for Gentiles. We won't look at the passages, but you see passages in Acts, you see passages in Ephesians that help us know those who are far off from a Jewish perspective are Gentiles. For all who are far off, now notice, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So everyone who's called by the gospel and is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now Luke is not going to contradict himself. So when Luke says in Acts 8, Verses 15 and 16, the apostles came down so that these who had been baptized in Jesus' name might receive the Spirit because as yet the Holy Spirit had not come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. He's not saying they hadn't received the gift of the Spirit promised in baptism. But I think this is one of my critiques of the NIV. You know, there is no perfect translation of the Bible. Uh, they're, because they're made by men, they're going to be little mistakes here or there. I think most all major committee translations are great. And overall, they won't lead you astray. But you can point out little things that are wrong with every one of them. I think overall, the NIV is the best translation for Christians in the 21st century. I think close to it is the ESV. Both of them together, I mean, really give you a good sense of what the apostles wrote. But here, I really wish the NIV would have translated this more literally. I think this is, this is one place where they're um, trying not to be overly literal but understandable. Translating the original text in idiom idiomatic English has, has done a disservice to us. So look at verse 16. It says, because the Holy Spirit had not yet... Now the NIV says, come on any of them. Literally, it's fallen. He had not yet fallen fallen on any of them. Now, and this is one of the mistakes that I had you correct in your outline. That, that Greek word that's translated here, come, literally fallen, occurs three times in the book of Acts relative to the Holy Spirit. And I would argue that it is a technical term that means a miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's notice the other two times that it occurs. Look at Acts 10. Now, we talked last week about uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 10, uh, verse 44 beginning, we read about Cornelius and his household's baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we're told, verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit, now the NIV says, came, literally, fell. Same Greek word in Acts 8.16. Fell on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished at the gift of the Holy Spirit, excuse me, the gift the Holy Spirit had poured out on, uh, even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So here it's a miraculous manifestation of the Spirit. Look at chapter 11 of Acts. Verse 15. Peter says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit, the NIV says, came, literally fell, fell on them as he had fallen on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the promise of baptism in the Holy Spirit. So Peter's referring back to the same event. So you see in Acts 10 and Acts 11, fall relative to the Holy Spirit is a miraculous manifestation. And I would say that that clearly is the meaning here 
Because when the apostles lay hands on the uh, uh, people of Samaria, notice verse 18, Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given. Now, you've witnessed a lot of baptisms before. Have you ever seen the Holy Spirit given to somebody at baptism? No. We don't see it. We know it happens by faith, but we don't see it. Now, hopefully, sometime down the road, we see some fruit of it in their life, you know, by living uh, a Christ-like life, but you don't immediately see it. But Simon was able to see it. So, I would say these passages together, again, Luke's not going to contradict himself, and the Lord's promise is not going to fail. They received the common gift of the Holy Spirit when they were baptized, but they didn't receive a miraculous manifestation until the apostles came down and laid hands on them. And it's such a notable thing. Here's Simon, who's been accustomed to making money by wonder working. We're told, verse 18, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability that anyone, everyone, on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, important point. Very important point. Philip had the ability to work miracles. And Philip had worked miracles among the Samaritans. Philip baptized those Samaritans, but Philip did not lay hands on any of the Samaritans and pass on the Holy Spirit to them. Simon had followed Philip all around and watched Philip perform all these miracles. Verse 13 tells he was astonished. But as far he never tried to buy the ability to lay hands on someone and pass on the Holy Spirit from Philip. It's just the apostles. So from this, I think we are, we are safe to derive the inference that the apostles who had been baptized in the Holy Spirit so as to you know, supply the church's lack of a New Testament, they and they alone had the ability to lay hands on first century Christians and pass on the Holy Spirit so that churches like Corinth could have their need of a New Testament supplied when an apostle wasn't around. So they would have prophets among them and miracle workers among them, etc. Okay? But the inference is, once the apostles died, nobody's left to lay hands on people and pass on these miraculous gifts. We saw that as of the time that Ephesians was written, there's just one baptism. And it's got to be water baptism because that is supposed to last until Jesus comes again into the end of the age, the Great Commission tells us, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. So Holy Spirit baptism is not available. And whenever the apostles died, the only other means through which a miraculous manifestation of the Spirit could be given, it was taken away. But by the time the apostles died, we didn't need the miraculous gifts because what did we have? The New Testament. Because Jesus told the apostles, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you, you apostles, into all truth. So by the, by the time the apostles were taken out of the church, the church had all new covenant truth. And in fact, when later discussions in the church came up, as to what books deserve to be in the New Testament canon, what books do not need to be in the New Testament canon, a key thought is, is it apostolic? Did it come from an apostle or from someone closely associated with an apostle? That, that's the key. If it, if it came later than the apostles, it's not a legitimate book. It's got to come from the apostles. So the apostles were guided into all truth. So you know this is one of the reasons, perhaps the main reason, why I don't think Pentecostalism is legitimate. Um, you know, I don't, I don't buy the claim that the Holy Spirit is directly leading anybody into new truth today or is empowering anybody to perform miracles because the means through which those gifts were given in the first century church is taken away. All right, so any, any comments on this? before we notice the common manifestation of the Spirit that we all have. So are you going to talk about Acts 19 or not at all? I, I mean, we can. I was, You're saving time. I, yeah, I was saving time. I mean, you see, you see basically the same thing in Acts 19 where Paul, after baptizing some people in water, 
And, and by the way, the phrase, in Jesus' name, occurs there. So they receive the Holy Spirit as per the promise of Acts 2, but then after that, Paul lays hands on them and they receive a miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in tongues. Now, there are arguments against this. Uh, I don't know how much you keep up with what people say. I mean, as a preacher, I kind of feel obligated to keep up with what people say, but Max Licato actually now claims to be a charismatic. He claims that uh, he has spoken in tongues and that miraculous gifts of the Spirit are now available. And so he critiques this view that the Holy Spirit was only given through the laying on of the apostles' hands and their arguments he offers and their answers, I believe, to those arguments. But, um, I mean, you see this viewpoint more and more, even you know, among those, which I don't, I don't really think that Max Licato identifies himself as a member of Churches of Christ any longer, but... Um, but you see this even among some members of the church. So what we've got the New Testament then uh, laying on of hands past the Holy Spirit for, for performing miracles wasn't necessary. That's right. Yeah, it wasn't necessary. I mean, my viewpoint is the miraculous gifts ceased when all the apostles died and everyone upon whom an apostle had laid hands died. So... Um, you know, I, I do believe that miraculous gifts could have lasted into the second century. You know, tradition says that um, John the Apostle didn't die until the reign of Emperor Trajan. And wasn't Trajan, what, 98 to 117? So, you know, and then, you know, he could be laying hands on people, presumably, let's just say up until 117. So... So, you know, I would, I would put it into the, into the second century when legitimate miracles cease. Now, now, by the way, I'm not denying that miracles may happen today. And by that, I, okay, so I believe God still answers prayer, right? But my definition for a miracle is a little bit tighter than that. You know, even if the answer to a prayer is something that nature couldn't accomplish, I don't deny However, that there may be people today who occasionally perform a miracle here or there. I mean, in fact, there, there is one instance. And only I've tried to look into this. Um, I've, I've read biographies on, on um, well, why am I going? Or Roberts and, and others have read about the charismatic movement. Uh, you know, I've been interested to see, you know, what, what proof do they have for, for you know, real miracles? I, I actually think that uh, I saw on video a, a, a miracle of healing. Now, uh, I'm not positive of that. I, I mean, I think in terms of probabilities, I'd kind of lean in that direction. But I would say that uh, if it were a legitimate miracle of healing, that it was not empowered by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not the only spirit that can perform miracles. You know, you go back into the Old Testament and, uh, for instance, Deuteronomy 13, and Moses said, hey, if a prophet comes along and, you know, he gives you a sign that comes to pass and he says, hey, come and worship this other God, don't believe him. Now, implying there, there could be a miracle. But if that miracle confirms something that is contrary to Scripture... That miracle didn't come from God. Look at Matthew chapter 7 for just a minute. And if you're interested, I mean, you can, you can search it up on YouTube. Delia Knox is the lady that I think may very well have been healed at one of these revivals. I mean, she was in a car wreck and was paralyzed for 20 years. And in a healing service... Uh, stood up from her wheelchair. And I mean, it was documented. This lady could not walk in a healing service, stood up from, from her wheelchair. And, you know, it was not a full recovery immediately, but uh, over a matter of months, it was a full recovery. She walks now. Now, it just so happens that this happened in a church that would preach what I believe to be a false gospel. You know, whenever they issue their altar call, they promise people salvation 
simply by asking Jesus into their heart. And, you know, I don't believe that that's, that that's a true gospel. I believe that that's a false gospel. Uh, I mean, if, if, now I'm really getting off topic, <laughs> but that's okay. If, uh, if in the book of Galatians, Paul says it is a false gospel for someone to come along and preach Jesus, preach the cross, preach all of that, preach you've got to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and be circumcised. If Paul says that is a false, damnable gospel, and anyone who preaches it should be anathema, even if an angel from heaven or himself preaches it, he should be anathema. Why would we say a gospel in which you subtract from the plan of salvation would be a true gospel? The Bible says it's as sinful to take away from God's word as what it is to add to God's word. You see that three times, beginning of the Bible, Deuteronomy 4, 2, middle of the Bible, Proverbs 35 and 6, end of the Bible, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. If the Judaizing gospel is a false gospel, then the present day, ask Jesus into your heart, you don't have to be baptized, is also a false gospel. But here's what Jesus, here's what Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21 and following, in the context of false prophets. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. By the way, there's the sinner's prayer. Kurii, kurii. Vocative case, calling on the Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Not, I don't know you now. I used to know you, but I don't know you now. I never knew you. In the context, why did he never know them? It's because they didn't do what was necessary to enter into a covenant relationship with him. And in the context of Matthew, how does Matthew end? Make disciples. How do you make disciples? How does someone enter into a relationship with Jesus? Baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's how they become mine. I think that it's fair to say that this is a prophecy concerning the state of things since the gospel has become corrupted and people no longer uh, preach that you've got to be baptized to be saved. And we're told in that context, a lot of people are going to be thinking that they perform miracles. And I think there's a possibility that some may actually do it. But don't believe it. Like in Deuteronomy, if someone performs a miracle but leads you in a way that's contrary to Scripture, don't believe them. Scripture is the surest thing you have. The same is true today. And that, that was the point in 2 Peter when we were talking about the transfiguration. Peter said, listen, we've not followed fables made up by men. And I know that because, hey, uh, you know, we were with the Lord on the holy mount when we heard the voice from heaven say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Peter said, I know we're not following a myth because of my experience. But then he quickly follows up his experience by saying, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as into a lamp churning in a dark place, etc. What's more sure than my experience? The surest thing we've got is the word of God. And so, so regardless of what miracle somebody may perform that, you, that we think they've performed or whatever, if it's contrary to scripture, don't believe it. Don't be duped because Satan and his demons are still active in this world. Right, any comments on that? All right, well, let's, let's move on then to the, the third point. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and this, okay, let's, let's just go back to Acts 2.38. And I made this, I've made this argument before, but... So, so if, if I were to critique parts of the Lord's Church, parts of our brotherhood, it would be on this point. I think that this is overall the weakest point in the theology of many in churches of Christ. Not everybody in churches of Christ, but many. I mean, like where I went to school, um, you know, I would be considered virtually a heretic <laughs> for holding the viewpoint that I hold, uh, that, that the Holy Spirit is personally, 
in Christians for the purpose of giving them strength, enabling them to carry out God's word. Uh, but I think that this is such an important part of the gospel. You know, in Acts 2.38 again, we emphasize so much, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we say you've got to be baptized to have your sins forgiven. And that is right, that is important. But what follows is just as important. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, while the forgiveness of sins takes care of the problem of our past, the gift of the Holy Spirit helps us with the problem of our future. So the sins of the past are wiped away in baptism, but in baptism we receive an empowerment in the person of the Holy Spirit to live the holy life that God has called us to live. And, and you know... Lots of people will come along and they'll argue, like this is what I was taught in school. They'll argue that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They link it up with the passage we just looked at in Acts 8. And they say, okay, you've got all 12 apostles here present. So everybody who was baptized, upon all of them apostles laid hands, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is this miraculous empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, in arguing against that, I'd say you've got two problems. Problem number one, and we don't have time because the bell rang, but you look at the passage, problem number one is you don't see anybody except an apostle working a miracle in the book of Acts until you get to Acts 6. Now, that's an argument from silence, and there are weaknesses in that. And so that's not the totality of my case. But, but you don't just see this, this flurry of miracles performed by everybody in the church, by all 3,000 who were baptized that day. My second part to the argument, which I believe is, is the stronger part, is verse 39. Verse 39 universalizes the promise, including the gift of the Holy Spirit. It says, the promise is for you and your children, that is for the Jews, and for all who are far off, all the Gentiles. And then the next part, this includes us, for all whom the Lord our God will call. We're called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Were you called by the gospel and were you baptized as a result of your call of the gospel? Well, if so, the promise is for you. The promise that your sins are forgiven and you've gotten the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people argue, well, okay, so the gift of the Holy Spirit is not a miracle, but the gift of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Spirit through the Word. So, yeah, the Bible says we have the Holy Spirit in us, but it doesn't tell us how. It affirms, it, it affirms the fact, but not the mode. And so the way the Holy Spirit dwells in us is through the Word, they say. Because they say the Holy Spirit always operates through the Word. Ephesians 6, 17 says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Just as a soldier doesn't, with his own hand, personally kill someone he's in battle with, he uses that sword. The sword is the medium through which he does battle. The Word of God is the medium through which the Holy Spirit does battle. And so that's the way the Holy Spirit dwells in us, they say. But that won't work in this context. because no, And I've made this argument many times, but, but I, think, I don't think this can be answered. Of course, I don't think any of my arguments can be answered, but I really don't think this one can be answered, okay? I'm, I'm joking. All right, let me just say this real quick. All right, verse 38. On what side of baptism does the gift of the Holy Spirit come? Does it come before or after baptism? It's after you get the Holy Spirit after baptism. Okay, drop down, look at verse 41. Those who accepted his message, literally, those who received his word, Peter's word, were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. On what side of baptism does the reception of the word of God occur? Before or after? Before. Those who received his word were baptized. So, if we get the word of God before baptism and we get the gift of the Holy Spirit after baptism, then... Receiving the Word of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit are not the same thing. And there are other passages that I think show that we can distinguish the presence of the Word of God in a Christian and the presence of the Holy Spirit in a Christian. Look, look at Hebrews 6 verses 46 as an example. 